Hi, I'm Joy Han Silva. And I'm Laura Han Segundo Collins. And welcome to Hanacity. Hey, Joy, how's it going? <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm excited, but also a little nervous. Yeah, definitely. But it's good to be in the same city starting this with you. Yeah. How so, does it feel to be in back in New York City for you? It's been lovely. Got to see a couple old friends, which has been really sweet. It's been great to reconnect with people that I haven't seen in a while and also be in a city that's really special to me. So it's yeah. been good to be here. And it's been fun be to have you here too. Yeah. I can get to see you and the kids and yeah it's been nice it's true um well welcome to those who are listening mm-hmm. we feel really honored that you've taken some time to spend with us today joy and i are in a bit of pain <laughs> we're sitting on the floor right now mm-hmm. yeah. yeah where are you on the pain scale joy and what hurts today <laughs> I mean, ironically, when I landed, I was okay. And literally the next day I threw my back out of place. So that's the comedy of it. Tell them doing what? (laughs) (laughs) I was stretching and I tried to do a split and I pulled my back. Or babes. Well, actually today it's much better. First day was probably an eight. Mm -hmm. I think we're down to maybe like a six now, which is good. I'm not doing any workouts, so that's the good news. I'm literally just getting like, dishes yeah. out of our dishwasher when you shouldn't be. I'm doing TikTok videos with your son who's schooling <laughs> me on the basketball court, one or the other. Right, right, right. <laughs> awesome. So maybe let's get, let's set the scene. Okay. I want to welcome everybody again. Joy and I are sharing our story for the first time and in many ways with each other. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of exciting and also super scary. It's not Mm -hmm. something that we're used to doing. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe let's start at the very beginning. A very Very good good place place to to start. start. All right. Why don't you tell everyone where we're from? Yeah. Joy and I grew up in Southern California. Our moms are technically from North Korea and they have this wild story about, I think my mom was about five. And Joy's mom was a newborn when they escaped North Korea with our kick-ass grandparents right after the Shiniju incident, which uh, their town is from basically the border with China up Mm -hmm. there. We just cross a bridge and you'd be into China. So that's how far up. Our grandparents grew up bilingual Japanese Korean because the Japanese occupied Mm -hmm. Korea, the entire peninsula practically. And probably growing up, we had no real understanding of how that would be a survival skill. It was always just like, wow, grandma and grandpa know Japanese. That's really interesting. Yeah. Right. And how much of our history is being colonized? Mm -hmm. That's a whole other thing Mm -hmm. next season, I suppose. (laughs) So stay tuned. (laughs) But I think that speaks to a lot about how we grew up as being kids of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Not only do they have this, I think, this incredible story of resiliency, which is, it's a tiring word in many ways, but it's true because my mom was only five Mm -hmm. and she always remembers her grandmother telling our grandmother, you know, just leave Songja here. She's five. She's too big to carry. She's too small to keep walking. Right. Whereas your your mother was a newborn Maybe. and we could sort yeah. of held. And then there was two more kids, right. grown kids that could hold their own a little bit longer. But it took them weeks to get down to Korea. And then they had this crazy of being in the refugee camp for our, some time. And then finally, I think grandpa got a job mm-hmm. in Seoul. They were living in that area through the Korean War and then their roof got blown off. Mm-hmm. And after that, grandpa said, yep, let's take them and we'll move to Busan. Because at least I, I believe the... United States headquarters was there and they felt a little bit safer. Right. And I think like our grandparents, the hugest part of what they felt was really important was sticking together. Thinking about your mom being five and the opportunity to leave her behind was something that was not even considered in our grandparents' mind. Like they were really determined to keep everyone together, really determined to make sure that their family 
had opportunities, had a future that seemed flourishing. That was like a big thing for grandma and grandpa was like, even if we would put our family in risk, that it would give an opportunity, not only for us, but for our children to have a better life. And that was sort of like the narrative that they always stuck with. Every transition that they made, whether they were coming from the North to the South or moving to a bigger city or even coming to America later on when our parents grew up, the biggest thing was that they wanted their family to be together and have these solid ties, right? Now, we we know these stories so well, Joy. I'm Mm -hmm. curious about your dad's side. Yeah, so my dad grew up in a small country town in Hawaii on the big island. And pretty much that island was, I would say, a pretty small town. Dirt roads, everybody kind of knew everyone. and Everybody has the same plumber, the same gardener. Like, it's pretty wild. I don't know how big of a population it is, but it's fairly small. And he grew up pretty poor. It was him with two other siblings. My grandfather came when he was a young boy to Hawaii through the sugar plantation, because that's where a lot of Portuguese immigrants came to, to work in the fields. And he was a young boy. And then my grandmother, she is third or fourth generation. So she grew up in Hawaii, also had a pretty traumatic childhood where I believe had a stepmother that was pretty harsh. And I think my grandmother moved out of her home when she was a young teenager. Like I think she was 14 when she ended up going out on her own. Wow. Yeah. And like basically worked from 14 on. Another story of resilience, you know, of just working to make ends meet. My, my grandfather got married and then they had three kids and I think they lived a pretty modest life. Like I said, a small town in Hawaii. And then my father was a pretty, um, I guess, ambitious kid, you would say. It's kind of wild to think about, but he was the popular kid in school, did really well, studied really hard. I think his main purpose was to get an education so that he could better his life and then went out to college in Southern California. Wow. Yeah. And your grandmother's side is, you said, fourth generation. I believe so. Yeah. From where? was the, Where is the originating I mean, I don't, I don't even know. Like, I just know it's China and I don't even know, like maybe my aunt would know. I would probably have to go and like dive in deep into that family tree because I think they say colonization is such a huge thing. Right. And my grandmother, I don't even think she knows much of her story, which is kind of crazy. So really your grandmother, not even like she knows in terms of, I think her immediate family, but I don't know if she can trace all the way back further than that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. What about you? What about your dad? What's his story? My dad's story. Well, the Segundos, we don't even know where the actual name comes from because the Philippines was colonized by Spain Mm -hmm. and the Spanish folks, for some reason or another, didn't like Islander names. So they had a whole list and families had to go and change their names. Whoever decided in our family on my grandfather's side to change whatever their last name was to Segundo. My grandmother's side is actually pretty cool though, because she was able to keep the Islander name. They kept Upsay. So mm. that's pretty kick-ass actually. That is badass. It says a lot about your grandmother too. Yeah. She was a tough cookie. Hilarious. Love parties. My dad and his brothers, they grew up on an island called Bohol, Maribohok, Philippines. An area also known as the Visayans the group of people that the Spaniards called them the Pintados. So they would have just tattoos everywhere, but that's not uncommon. I think of the Philippines in general, mm-hmm. um, but that the island is quite small. I think my dad told me once many years ago that he walked from one side of the, of the island to the other Whoa. 12 hours or something. Oh, it's wow. famous for an area called the chocolate Hills dying to see it. And back then when he was growing up, he, his father died when he was seven. His father was part of the guerrilla warfare against the Japanese during World War II, leaving grandma with five boys. Awesome. But their house was on stilts, no electricity or running water. The, uh, the place would flood. That's why the houses would be on stilts. And my dad, after his dad died, his mom just hustled, would go out there and do anything she could to take care of those five boys. The brothers were very, very close mainly because I don't think they have parents around. So they leaned on each other super mm. hard. That sounds a little familiar. Yeah, doesn't like... it? <laughs> so yeah. the cousins told me after all of our dads died that 
grandma, the kick-ass one. But when my dad was 11, she said, hey, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the States and go on vacation. I'll see you guys in a few weeks. And she didn't come back. So Jeez. he was without two parents from 11 years old until he reunited with her in the States in 1950. 59. My grandmother applied for those visas for them because, you know, now Chinese exclusion is over. People from the Asians can enter the United States. Mm. Right. So now they have this chance at a visa. They, she gets a visa for them. The boys come over. He, Uncle Rosmo and Uncle Nick, they borrowed money from somebody who I can't remember who he said, but to pay them back, they had to work the fields. So my dad yeah. would go to high school in Soledad, California and work the fields. So when you're passing through Salinas, Monterey, Soledad, that area, you can imagine Nick Rosmo and Val, you know, working those fields. Wow. It's really beautiful. It's absolutely a great place to raise family. Mm -hmm. I have really fond memories, but we just didn't spend that much time with them. Yeah. The Korean side, I think, really overtook the other families. That was like yeah. the one that we leaned on the most. I don't know if it was because they all... We're in Los Angeles and that made things easier. Or if the dynamics of our mother's family was just dominating and that whoever married into that family sort of had to adopt that family tradition. Maybe it was a little bit of both. I mean, my dad's family was all in Hawaii. Your cousins were all over, right? They were like up north in Salinas and you probably only had a couple in LA, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, part of it might be location, but when I think about just the way that we grew up, my mom's family was definitely more dominating than my relationship with my family on my father's side. And hence, like I know more about my mom's history than I know about my dad's history, right? Like there's also a revelation in that. Why were those stories told to us when we were little, but not our father's stories? Mm -hmm. My dad's not really an open man, so I don't know. I don't think that he wouldn't tell me, but I, it's not something that he would just come and sit down and share his history with us. Yeah. I would say though, I'm grateful to have gotten to grow up with you. Yeah, You and your brothers are some of my favorite people in the entire universe. I think that if you ask me and my brothers who our favorite cousin is, and I know I have others cousins. I love you guys all, <laughs> but I think you're my favorite. I think you're my favorite too. Yeah. So this is a good question. Yes. What would you remember yourself as a kid? And I will definitely share with you what I remember of you being a kid. Ooh. So Joy is three years younger than me, Yeah. by the way. I remember I was a really shy kid, painfully shy. Like I think I had a hard time in really new environments, would hide behind my parents a lot when there's like new people that would come over for dinner or like if we were meeting somebody, I was an intense feeler. <laughs> And so my feelings just felt very overwhelming sometimes. I think people would say super sensitive. I know you don't like that word, but <laughs> but I also, I was really determined as I found things that I really enjoyed to do. And mainly it was things that I was good at. That's probably why I enjoyed them <laughs> because of the perfectionist in me. I was obsessed with that thing. I would do that thing over and over and over again. And through that, I think as a little kid, I had a lot of confidence in my ability, a quiet competitor. So if it was something like somebody was challenging me in something, and if somebody did better than me, I always tried to figure out a way to be better than that person. Like it was a good way of us pushing each other. Um, and so if I found somebody that would challenge me, it was, this is strategically a good way in order for me to better myself. I would say a very determined kid and had really ambitious goals at a young age. I think that I had really big goals. It's really interesting in retrospect how things have changed as I've gotten older and within time that we can share later on. But I think I was somebody that had a lot of confidence and ambition as a little girl. And I don't know where that went, you know? <laughs> Still there. Yeah, it's just hiding. I think it's just <laughs> trying, to, trying to awaken it a little bit, right? <laughs> Definitely. How would your parents respond or your brothers or the people around you, mm. myself included? Like, what were we like for you as a kid who is self-identifying as an intensive feeler? I mean, I definitely think my parents babied me when I was little. I don't think that it's 
to a fault. I think they really loved us and they really wanted us to have a very carefree childhood where there was no intensity. There was just a lot of care and love in our household. My parents probably at fault spoiled us quite a bit. I don't know if it was them making up for the childhood that they didn't have and wanted to give us. I had a childhood of of excess, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You had the best house ever. (laughs) Yeah. It would be like filled with toys, filled like we had a pool. We had a lot of things. I don't remember my parents saying no to a lot of things. I think they're strict in other ways. I think that my parents coddled me when I was a little girl. I think there was this immediate dependency that I had on them. So if I was not with them constantly, there was always a fear of them not coming back. And I don't know why. Like I was always, as a little girl, I had a really hard time doing sleepovers because I would be so afraid that I wouldn't be picked up or something like that. I don't know if it was this need for my parents to make me dependent on them. Like, I think they enjoyed that a little bit. Oh, Oh, you love us so much. You don't want to leave us. (laughs) You're friggin' adorable. But I I do think that, that, yeah, I think they enjoyed the fact that we wanted to be around them constantly. I mean, with my older brother, I think he just thought I was a baby. He would tease me. So he wasn't really that sensitive. (laughs) (laughs) I think you babied me. I think like it was, yeah. Like we definitely fought over you for sure. (laughs) For sure. I remember Natalie, for anyone that doesn't know, I have an older sister, Natalie, who we'll talk about later. And she's about 10 and a half years older than I am. I used to get so jealous when Joy would spend time with Natalie because I would want Joy. (laughs) You were like the one that we all got to sort of fight over. I mean, the Silvas were freaking adorable. You and John. You're the cutest kids and the sweetest kids. So, so sweet. It was always so much fun to throw on y'all because I was a spaz. I was the opposite of you. (laughs) I I always thought of you as the cool one. Oh, no. Really? Yeah. Wow. I would not have guessed that at all. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, tell me what you think of you and then I'll tell you my thoughts about you. I think if ADHD were a diagnosis that was handed out back then, I beyond would have fit it. I was such a spaz. I was so hyper, so hyper, so hyper that Miss Hall in first grade couldn't handle me. And this is 1980, what, three, two, something around that. It was like the dunce cap in the corner because I was just restless. I couldn't sit still. I clearly remember being put behind a bookshelf in first grade she would be teaching the class and I couldn't see what was going on, but I think she just couldn't handle me anymore, which looking back, I don't blame her because I think I was a bit much high spirited beyond that. (laughs) I don't even Mm. know what a nuclear version of that. I think that was me. And I would be pushing the books out so I could see the classroom. I have these snippets of her getting mad some years ago after my dad died and we were cleaning out the house and he had kept every single report card. Yeah. And the report card for first grade was wildly bright, as you would expect from math and science, just like my son. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I definitely birthed myself in my son, but the constant, distractible, difficult, all about behavior. I could not be disciplined, unruly mm. disciplined. But that's six years old-ish or whatever, first grade. Hmm. But I think I was an extremely obedient kid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I got in trouble, I would try really, really hard. I didn't Mm -hmm. want to do bad. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. My parents worked crazy hours. They would be out 6, 6 6.30 in the morning. Somebody would magically drop me off at school somehow. And then I took the bus home. I used to have a cat, Kitty. Kitty was an alley cat who showed up to our house and the cat I believe this must be our ancestors, but she would meet me at the bus stop, which was across the street from our house every day, every day after school, since I was six years old. And she would walk me across and there would inevitably be a dead mouse or a sparrow or something at the door because I have to be fed baby bird. I'd go inside, lock the door and I would be by myself for hours as latchkey latchkey times. Yeah. She would go around to the back in the garage. There was a little door that was open and we'd hang out for a little bit and then she'd take off again. That was every day. And this is before cell phones and stuff. So 
my parents would say, we, you know, it's us because the, the phone is going to go ring, ring, stop, ring, stop, and then pick up the next ring. That way, you mm. know, it's us. And it would be many, many hours by myself. Wow. That's a lot. Many years ago, my parents were figuring out whether or not to stay or, or to sell the house. And they decided to stay after all kinds of ideas, but we had to paint the house. And my feet prints, hand prints are all over that house. <laughs> it's all over that house because I absolutely destroyed it. How many umbrellas I destroyed jumping off that banister trying to be married? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I would just climb on everything and just a wild, wild animal mm -hmm. inside a cage, but a very obedient one. So if mm -hmm. my parents mm -hmm. said, Laura, don't do that, I would absolutely feel terrible about it. It yeah. didn't take much. My mom would make this sound. I'm sure your parents have a sound. Maybe you all have a sound that your parents would make. But my mom would go, mm -hmm. she'd make that sound. Mm -hmm. And her eyes, she wouldn't blink. And there would be white around the dark stuff of her eyeballs. Yeah. And I, yeah. just that sound. And yeah. I would be quiet. quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, as remembering you as a little girl, like I said, I always thought you're like the cool one. Because whatever you did, you were always really good at whatever you did. And so you're somebody that excelled naturally to things and physicality was definitely one of them. I mean, if you're climbing everywhere, your feet print are like on the walls and ceilings, like how the hell did that happen? But it was obviously you were a really bright kid and you were also really artistic. Yeah. Like you drew a lot. I remember I all the drawings that you would have, or I think anything that you did, it was sort of as a little girl, I was like, wow, she's just really good at whatever she did. And probably it's because of how I really respected people that did things well as a little girl. And so it was like, whoa, I want to be just like, <laughs> I think there's a lot of that, you know, I think it's very obvious when I was a little girl that I was your shadow. There's a lot of photos that you'll see me right next to you or, oh, or every staring single, over you or every whatever. Single birthday party. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody give that girl a seat. <laughs> I don't know why you just didn't sit I'm there. I'm pretty sure there was a seat available. I just probably had shot my way right oh. next to you. Oh, bye. Yeah. Bye. yeah. If somebody was sitting there, I kind of scooted in between because it was my rightful spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought you were the cool one. Oh, joy. Yeah. That's very sweet. Aw, look at us, a love fest. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's kind of fast forward a little yeah, bit. Let's right? do that. So gymnastics became a huge part of both of our lives. This is like the beginning of our story. How did you get into gymnastics? How was gymnastics introduced to you? Give us a, a brief summary of that. Full disclosure, I can't remember a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how I got completely into it. And that's probably something Natalie and Joanne, who we'll talk to later, will help me piece together. But I remember taking a tumbling class. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after, I remember finding my way to flares. I don't know how. I don't know who that Natalie would probably know. But I took a class and I knew that I just, I really liked it. I do remember it was 1984, the Olympics. We were watching Mary Lou Retton. She was doing a front flip on something, beam or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's the big deal? What's the big deal about that? And I went into our house. We had this big room. We had this huge house, mm -hmm. too much house for what my parents were able to do back then, but it was, so it wasn't furnished. <laughs> Just, there's lots of empty space and that mm -hmm. one of the big empty spaces. A I gymnast could, world there. Yeah. That I would climb all over right? so I'd be by <laughs> myself. And I think I walked into a room and I tried the front flip in that room. Jeez. Yeah. That was amazing. I do remember that. Cause I remember thinking, that can't be that big of a deal. I can do that. Where did you land on? I think on my butt. You did. Okay. So I you're did. able to make a rotation. I made a it's rotation. It's not like you landed on your head or anything. No. Yeah. That's incredible. I looked at Natalie. I think, <laughs> I think I said, see, <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember flash. And then I met Flares. Flares mm -hmm. was in uh, Pasadena. And that's when I met Joanne Bakken, who we'll talk to soon. And it was an immediate, perfect place for me. Mm. My home. I mean, you know this, but my parents who are phenomenal, wonderful individuals were terrible together. And so our home wasn't exactly the nicest place in the world to grow mm -hmm. up, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, spending time with each one individually was great. Mm -hmm. I have a great relationship with both my parents. I have all kinds of wonderful memories, but it was really tense. It was always yeah. tense. It was yeah. a tense childhood in that house. Mm -hmm. 
And I really feel for my sister, most of all, she probably took the brunt of it mm. being 10 years ahead of me. I was definitely an accident. <laughs> <was> like, mm. <laughs> probably definitely not a planned, but I think I was a very welcomed member mm-hmm. of the family by the mm-hmm. time I came around. And I, my sense of my parents and my sister when I showed up was that, oh, good, we have a baby to take care of. And I think it sort of brought them together. So I also mm. benefited from a luxury of having a good relationship with all three of them mm. that really looked after yeah. me. So yeah. me going into gymnastics was not just about doing gymnastics, which was in and of itself so fun. Give me more. I can yeah. do this all day. It was yeah. an absolute playground. But the other side of it was like, there was just for a few hours that I didn't have to be in that house. Yeah. That house was just so super tense. Gymnastics was perfect for me because I just wanted to master it. I liked doing things, and I'm still this way in my mid 40s, where I it has to be done to my liking. I don't necessarily care about someone else's liking, but I, it needs to be to my liking. There was always that moment, like you're playing a game and you get that video game or something, and you get to that point, and it just takes off like a the superstar in Mario yeah, Brothers or something. Yeah, yeah. I could just feel it. I could always tell when I hit, and I did it in a way that put that little bit of oxytocin or adrenaline or whatever. And I would just feel like I was flying. And I love that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Gymnastics was perfect because it was not just flipping around that mastery of skills, but I loved dancing. It was the only way to express. And I think for you and me and probably Mm -hmm. many people growing up during our time, there's no space for emotions. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. no words for feelings. You just dealt with it. You didn't, you know, stop crying, too Mm -hmm. sensitive. There's always those words of just don't emote, just deal with it. But that was a way to emote. Right. All the frustration or or fear or whatever that I had would just be poured into those moments. Right. Gymnastics was absolutely for that, especially in the beginning. Yeah. And Joanne was a perfect coach to start that. Yeah. Yeah. How about for you? I definitely remember as a little girl being at your house. And you literally bending me like a pretzel and flipping my feet over my <laughs> head multiple times. And then you would show me something and you're like, like this. And then I would try it and probably fall on my neck. And you're like, no, 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 like this. And then you would throw my body into those things. Um, I definitely sorry. remember a lot of times just being like, I can't do it. And you're like, yeah, you can. And then you would like just flip me over or whatever. I'm so shocked that we've never break my neck or break my bones because with no gymnastics background, you had me doing stuff on your banister that was definitely higher than a beam. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely higher than four feet. Definitely higher and than four defi- feet. And it was very narrow. It was less than four inches. With no padding. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how the hell I didn't break anything, but was rolling on that and you did great. doing stuff. I don't know if it was great. <laughs> I don't know if it was great. I don't think I knew half the things that I was doing. But I do remember you teaching me a cartwheel and I was like, oh, like I could do it. And there was one day, I believe you were going to gymnastics and I don't know if it probably was Natalie, because I can't imagine who else would have taken us was like, do you want to try the class with Laura or whatever? And I don't think I really had a choice. I think I was, yeah, and I probably was there because <laughs> Laura's going, her going. And Joanne was there. And I remember being on beam and she had us doing cartwheels. It was the one thing that I knew I could do. And I remember for some reason, I was able to make every cartwheel. And then she had me do it on a medium height beam. I made it on every one of those. And then after practice, I don't know if she told Natalie or if maybe my dad picked us up, she had offered for me to do a kinder gym class or something like that. I believe I was like four. I was little. Baby. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a trial class with her. And I remember doing floor, we were just doing basics, rolls, handstands and back extension rolls or whatever. There was a skill that the girls were doing that I had no idea how to do because all I really knew how to do was cartwheels and Laura flipping me through things. And I remember standing there and just frozen because I was, I don't know how to propel my body into this. And the girls in line were so annoyed with me that they started yelling at me to go. I just freaked out because I was an intense feeler. And so then it's this idea of these girls being annoyed with me or they hated me or they thought Mm. I was wasting their time. And I think Joanne didn't see that I didn't know what I was doing. And it was probably a total of maybe 10 seconds and it felt like 10 hours of girls yelling at me. And 
after practice, my dad asked me how it was. And I was like, it was awful. I'm never going oh, again. Babes. And I remember he forced me to go the following week and I cried so hard, hysterically cried in the car. I wouldn't get out of the car and Joanne had to come outside to ask me to come out. I remember her telling me, you don't have to do whatever you don't want to do. I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to, but I really hope you decide to come back. And I didn't. I was like, I'm done. See you later. Peace out, crazy lady. (laughs) (laughs) Never coming back. And I'm never going to do gymnastics ever again. And it was really just because I thought the girls hated me and that they were mean. And so then you were still excelling in gymnastics, probably was still flipping around on my own. I just started using my couch as my own balance beam and started doing cartwheels and probably learn how to do like, I don't know, like a walkover by myself or a hands. I don't know what I was doing. Right. And I think my parents were just like, okay, this is ridiculous. You're going to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I tumbled all the time at home. There was an obvious passion that I have for this sport. It was obvious that I liked it. And it was just all about these feelings that I didn't know how to articulate, right? The girls that were making me feel uncomfortable. And I don't think they were me. And I think it was just me being a little girl and just having a lot of feelings. I went back to Flair's to go see Joanne to take another class and she wasn't there. I don't know how we found her. I don't know because I think by this time when I went back, you have maybe already moved on to scats or something. We couldn't find her for a while. Maybe it was your mom that was able to track her down. She was opening up a gym of her own in Pasadena. And so that I would say is my real start from gymnastics. I think I was like seven, almost eight at that time when Joanne opened up her own gym in Pasadena. That was at Foothill. That was my first class. And then I sort of fell in love with it and stuck through it. And so I was with her for a big chunk of my early stages of gymnastics. I think I was there for over three years with her. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you want to go through these things? You wanted to go through a gauntlet of just fun questions? Yeah. Do you don't even think too hard about it. Like Spitfire? Let's do Spitfire. Okay. That sounds fun. Okay. So I'll ask you the questions. First. Yes, How questions? That? Okay. Okay. Who is your favorite gymnast or idol? I, <laughs> quick <this> questions. <laughs> <laughs> quick fire answers. <laughs> I think I would say Nadia Komnich because of the movie. Mm, that's a good one. You know that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. for sure. You, favorite gymnast, idol. Laura Segundo. <laughs> You're my favorite gymnast. That was easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You make me tear up every time you say that. <laughs> okay. What was your favorite or best event? Favorite event, beam, mm-hmm. hands down. Mm-hmm. My favorite was beam also. Was it your best? Probably. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say bars was up there too until you broke we will talk about this later, yeah, yeah. about the overtraining and the, the break yeah. that happened in 1988. Yeah. I would say, but up until then, bars was close, but beam was hands down my favorite. Yeah. Beam was my favorite. I'd say it it went back and forth between beam and floor as my best. So Mm -hmm. when did you know you were good? Mm. This is an excellent question because when I was a kid, I probably thought I knew I was good when I had moved to Texas and I was in the hopes group Mm. at Corolli's. That's when I thought, I think I'm pretty good. After mm. all, I think until then, I just focused on, I just like learning. Yeah. And yeah. then in 1980, it must have been 88, when I joined the Hopes group, that's when I thought, I actually think I'm maybe kind of good too. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. If I think about it, it goes in phases, right? Oh, you could be the best somewhere, but it's a small gym or you're a small fish and, you know, or you're a big fish in a small pond type of thing. So I think I have phases of, oh, I was pretty good here. But I think when I felt like, oh, this could be a possibility, like I could be pretty high up here and probably achieve my goal, I would say was my first competition away from home. We had a competition out in Hawaii and a former teammate of mine who was an Olympian, I beat the first day on balance beam. We won't say she had a fall. And I was like, damn, <laughs> I must be pretty decent if I'm oh, able to compete against gymnast. somebody that was definitely amazing yeah. um, and that I was able to keep up. So I think that's when I felt like, okay, then I must be good. Let me ask you the next, okay. next one. Did you have confidence in your ability? I don't know if I had confidence in 
my gymnastics ability because I think I wasn't the naturally talented kid. I think there's definitely girls or teammates that I had that I, that had natural talent that did things really easily and they their bodies just understood gymnastics. I think what I had confidence in was my work ethic. And so it was one of those yeah. things like I worked really, really hard. You did. And mm-hmm. I felt like I could outwork anybody. So if somebody that was better than me or more talented than me, I knew I could work harder than them. And that would be like yeah. the thing that would help me keep up. Totally. I think I had more confidence in my work ethic than I did in my gymnastics ability. Which is crazy because you had beautiful ability as well, by the way, just so you know. Did you have confidence in your ability? I had total confidence in my ability to control my body the way Mm. that I wanted it to. Absolutely. From the get-go. I think that's why I liked it so much. That was that feeling of being able to master stuff. I had control over it. And then when I started having injury and Mm. losing control over that, Mm. that's when the career started coming to a close, looking back, but, and that's intertwined with what we'll talk about later, which is really the messaging that goes into that. Looking back now as a parent and as a mid forties person looking and being able to see that this is not a fault of any child losing the confidence uh, over her body, but actually adults decisions into the creation of this loss of confidence because of the overtraining. Yeah. And then not being attuned to the athlete's needs. Right. But absolutely until I didn't. And that coincides with I would blame myself. Mm. And now I can look back and hug that little girl and say, you did nothing wrong. Yeah. yeah. You did nothing wrong. Yeah. People weren't looking out for you. Yeah. And that's not your fault that you've lost confidence. It doesn't make you lazy. It doesn't make you wrong. It doesn't mean that you're an idiot or an imbecile as they would like to say or you any use of those words Mm. there's a lot of survival that went into that yeah what was the moment for you that shifted from being a beginning gymnast to the next chapter I think it was very obvious that I was accelerating pretty quickly it's really interesting because I've reconnected with some old teammates of mine that I trained with and it was very clear in my mind that I wanted to go to the Olympics. I already had that mindset of like a really high expectation for where I wanted to go with gymnastics. And so it was really just about how do I get to that level? And so I did basically a trial class up in Northern California to train with a coach that we'll talk about later. (laughs) (laughs) And after doing that evaluation, and when he told me that I would be a great fit, I think that's when I felt like, well, if he thinks I'm great, or if he thinks I am worthy enough to be taught because he was this big person. Yeah. Then that was like, this must be more than just a recreational sort of achievement. This is something right. bigger, you know, right. like I'm stepping into the big leagues type of thing. And totally. I think the shift on how things were, you probably will talk about it after moving to Texas. There's like such a different shift when you get into intense high training gymnastics as opposed to it just being about having fun or everybody can do it because you're passionate and you can go as far as you can. But when it's, no, this is about training and training to when, right? Like it's not just training because you love it. It's training because you want to when (laughs) or training to make the Olympics and you sort of have to when in order to get onto that team, you're winning a spot on something. So yeah, there's a huge difference in in sort of the shift of culture. Mm -hmm. It's true. And you? moment when it shifted from beginning gymnastics to that next chapter? Probably the same time as moving to Texas as well, being in this group of phenomenal young Mm -hmm. gymnasts like me at that time with that same coach you're talking about. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And you're right. It's a super different vibe. It's crazy different vibe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure looking back, I probably did want to go to the Olympics. I wrote that in the diary. I I know Mm -hmm. those things. I just think I just wanted to master stuff. Mm. It's always been my focus. If I could win, great. That'd be awesome. I would love to win. But it was a whole vibe. That vibe, I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. People are serious about this in the same way that I am. Yeah. And, you know, and whether we call it, we want to win the Olympics or I want to master something, it's all in the same shelf, mm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I agree with you. It was yeah. definitely moving to a place where they thought that way. It's very true. 
just want to note we're really killing it on the short questions and short answers. Yeah, let's go faster. Okay. <laughs> Any compulsive type of routines or superstitions that you had? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I always had this thing on bars that I had to mentally close my eyes and go through my routine in my head, like this mental choreography that you do. And then I had to, it's kind of gross. I had to spit in my grips before I jumped on the bars. Very important. Because you needed goopy hands, right? Yeah. Like you needed sticky hands in order to be able to hang on to the bar. And I always had a teammate before I jumped on the bars with the extra spit on my dowels who she was badass. She was this girl who did level 10 gymnastics with bare hands. Wow. She, yeah. She's no grips. She's this girl from Romania and she had no grips on her hands and she would goop the bar for me because she was able to get it on her palms. Right. And she Amazing. would like goop the high bar. She had to do that every time I would do a routine. Totally. So, That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I only have one yeah. friend, my childhood friend, one of my besties. She was from Cincinnati. She was a phenomenal gymnast. Mm. Also fantastic. Super funny. And she too didn't wear grips. And That's I used to think crazy. that was the most amazing thing. Badass girls. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of who were your closest or best gymnast friends? My childhood is my friend Karina, who I saw literally last night. I hadn't seen her in over 10 years. She is this phenomenal human being. She was my best friend from eight until I left Joanne, which was like 11, 12. And then another sweet friend that hopefully will be on sooner is Kara. She was my best friend when I was living in Sacramento. I lived with my coach for the first year that I was away and I would try to fill my time with other families on the weekend so I didn't have to be home. Kara's family always took me in. And so thank you, Kara and Kara's family. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And she's the only friend that I brought home with me when I was living away. Mm -hmm. She's the only one that was able to see my home life with my family Amazing. when I was living away was Kara. I love you, Kara. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Hands down, one of my favorite human beings to date is Mariana. And mm. Sam, who is the phenom on the bars without grips, and Kathy. Yeah. Those three were monumentally important to me, but particularly Kathy and Mariana, we were in it to the very end. And we were still quite little in that yeah. group in comparison. And they also lived in the same complex that I lived in with my sister. And was, they were the people we could always count on sleepovers. Yeah. What was your favorite treat? I think pizza. I just feel like even to this day, pizza is like my favorite meal. I loved pizza and probably because we couldn't. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. We definitely like... couldn't have it. <laughs> and I do remember, I won't say the person's name, <laughs> but <laughs> I remember there's pizza at school and I got pizza when I shouldn't have. And this girl told on me. Oh, no. <laughs> it was really shitty. Oh. But. Mm. And it was worth it. <laughs> it was Delicious. so Delicious. Oh, what yeah. about you? Oh, I mean, anything that you're not supposed to have was a treat. But in particular, back in the day, TCBY was the big Royo, whatever it was. I forgot what it's called. Frozen Blizzard, what have you. There's the TCBY with Heath Bar. That was like mm. the big thing. But it could have been anything. Yeah. 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 Extra bread. Just have a piece of bread. Which you'll get a story okay. about breadsticks That's later right. on. <laughs> pancakes. I just yeah. want a pancake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was anything with caloric value of some sort. Yeah. Probably because you didn't have any calories. <laughs> right. Right. Else, exactly. Right? Okay. Last one. Okay. How did your family and friends respond to your talent growing up? I think friends that were at school and not my teammates it was actually really sweet. Like one of my friends from elementary school, he recently told me his wife was asking me some questions about gymnastics and he was like, really? I always looked up to you. And I was dumbfounded by that to like be somebody that like your peer looking up to a peer of yours at that young of age to have like somebody that would be like, oh my God, like I thought you were brilliant and I looked up to you, which I thought was really cool. And I didn't know that until recently. I think like when I was a little girl, I didn't think like people really cared. <laughs> I knew my brother, my younger brother, John, was always really proud of me. Yeah. And that was really, I get teary. Like, oh, as you yeah. should. I think my parents were, always had a humble 
response to my talent. They're like, oh, she does this. They didn't make a big deal out of it. So I don't think I, as a little girl, I thought like that my talent was really huge to them because I think they would downplay it. But I think the person that probably made me feel really big is my little brother. Yeah. How did your family and friends respond to your talent? Intellectually, I know they were very supportive. Emotionally, it is influenced by a toxicity of my memories of feeling like a failure when it didn't work out. Right. So my sister is number one cheerleader for sure. Right. Yeah. You and our family and friends, like I still have a couple of friends that are from that time. And I know everybody was very proud. I can see it. And I think I have three levels of removal from those emotions Uh because they're so intertwined with a sense of failure, even to this day. Which is so crazy because I think hopefully you'll find this healing for you because I think in our family, and I'm like including aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody, that you're absolutely brilliant at gymnastics. I think that we thought that you were incredibly talented. And as exciting as Natalie was on those videos, (laughs) (laughs) would yell like all of us would watch and be cheering too, so. Oh. And scene. We're done. <laughs> so I have a little secret to tell you. Uh-oh, no. I don't want to make yes. you cry. But when I was little, I used to imagine being in the Olympics and I always imagined us doing gymnastics together. And we're told And every time... In my head, like I'm in a competition and we're competing with each other. We always tied (laughs) and we would win together. I love that. Yeah. And I never competed with you or did training with you, which is crazy. Like you were always ahead of me, but we never, our paths never crossed. So no, just one, one in the stands. Always better that way in some ways. Yeah. I love that so much. (laughs) Yeah. The joy. Mm Mm-hmm. Just checking in. How are you doing? How is this for you? Um, it was really good. Definitely it was hard. But yeah, like cathartic, you know, like it was really good. Yeah. What about you? How do uh, you feel? Also, both. It's I wanna like well up. I'm like feel like I'm welled up. Mm. And then there's that part that just wants to keep it down. Even though I know this is a it's a long overdue thing. And I, there's nobody in the world that I could do this with except for you. Because I know we're not alone. The ones who didn't get to the point that we wanted. And often it's nothing that we did wrong. We were just little girls. And I know we've been waiting for this space and we need this space because we are parents and aunts and uncles and friends. Like we are raising children now. And I know, you know, we have old teammates that are walking around thinking like they weren't good or they weren't enough. And I know I was talking with an old friend about like, like, well, I just, you know, I didn't make it. So it's not that big a deal, even though you can sense in the tone how much of a deal it was. Mm. So I know this is going to be so hard and I feel really lucky to be with you in doing this. Same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of everything right now. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. When we were thinking of doing this together, that was sort of the heartbeat of the podcast, that it was for that generation of girls, those girls that were the almost, I think, yeah. you know, the could have, I guess, is more of yeah. probably a better like title. Like it wasn't that there was not talent or there was not capability of being on a team. Some of it is timing and luck. And it has nothing to do to minimize the talent of these girls, because when you're at that level, we talk about this all the time, and it's us having to like own that about ourselves, because it's been really hard for us to say that we were extraordinary talents. That's a really weird thing to say for us. But I think for our teammates out there who hopefully are listening, know that you are also an extraordinary talent. And that we see you and that this is a podcast for us. This is the podcast of those stripes of stories. And we do know the stories of Olympians. We do know the stories of the winners. We know those t- stories and they're wonderful and they should be Fantastic shared. And we're stories. not taking Fabulous stories. anything yeah. away from those stories. They no. need to be told, but so do ours. 
And yeah. this is the heartbeat of our podcast is for those voices to be heard and to amplify those type of stories. Absolutely. So in our next episode, we're going to be meeting with our very first coach, mm-hmm. Joanne Bakian, which none of this would have happened to both Joy and me without her. She was the ultimate cheerleader and talent finder. She was a scout. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the one who taught us not to say we can't, but mm-hmm. we can and we will keep working at it. She taught us really, truly not to give up. And her voice has been resonating for us, I think, in a major way right now yeah. in particular. So we can't wait to have you all meet her and learn and hear for yourselves how special she is yeah. to not just us, to so many. Yeah. Great. Talk about great coach. Mm-hmm. I wish there were more coaches like her out yeah. in the world. Yeah, for sure. I love you. I love you more. I love you most. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>